everybody and welcome to another episode of Game Theory. Today we're going to be looking at Shadow of Mordor, specifically its story and its compatibility with lore. Now I love the game Shadow of Mordor, but it has been the topic of much debate as to whether or not its story is truly canon or even compatible with canon. So let's get academic about this and examine the story of Shadow of Mordor in the wider context of Tolkien lore. The Shadow of Mordor story is actually a very simple one, so spoilers coming. It's about 30 years, give or take, following the recapture of the Lonely Mountain by the Dwarves of Erebor, and Gondor has apparently, according to this monolith interpretation, reoccupied the Black Gate, or Moriannon as it was known during the Second Age, and assigned a threadbare group of rangers to its defence. The War Commander, and therefore a Lord Marshal of Rangers, is a man named Hallis, who accepted the posting upon Moriannon to protect his son-in-law and pregnant daughter from the wrath of the Gondorian legal system. Hallis' son-in-law is, of course, Talion, a man who needs protection due to the fact that he killed a Gondorian nobleman named Lord Asgon, who was attacking his girlfriend, Yareth, at the time, uh, who later becomes Talion's wife. So, Hallas, his daughter Yareth, and Yareth's husband Talion move to the Black Gate where Talion is trained, presumably by Hallas, to be a ranger. This is where the story starts. A couple of things on the names used here. First of all, Hallas is a very strong Gondorian noble name. The best known example of somebody being called Hallas in the lore is Hallas the Tall, who was the 13th steward of Gondor. Don't get excited, however, as this Hallas died some 450 years before the events of Shadows of Mordor, but a Gond for a Gondorian noble, to have such a name probably indicates his worth to the state. Also, Asgon, the name of the noble who Talion murdered, was also the name of a lesser-known hero from the First Age, who apparently helped Turin escape from Dor Lamin after Turin killed an Easterling called Broda. It is interesting, therefore, that the nobleman Talion killed was named after a man who helped a hero escape from Dor Lamin after committing murder himself, so there's something kind of cute there. Now, during his posting on the wall, Hallas is big on sacrifice. Is one of sacrifice. We protect Gondor here in this barren land. The whole point of the post of war commander and the post of rangers of Moriannon, according to Hallis, is sacrifice for Gondor. So remember that, sacrifice. The post of ranger of Moriannon is essentially a life sentence, or so it's implied. Very similar to being posted on the wall in A Song of Fire and Ice. There is a distinct intertextual link here, right down to the idea of a non-nobleman being taken under, under wing by Lord Commander of the Wall, but that analysis is for another time. Now, getting back to sacrifice, even Talion, when reciting a poem originally composed by the rangers of Athelion, emphasizes the need for a ranger to embrace the idea of sacrifice. There is a thematic hint for the game's narrative here, that of sacrifice. Of course, sacrifice, being a word without context, is not a theme in itself yet, but it's a start and a hint as to where the game is going thematically. So, what happens? Well, Talion and Yerith have a son, Durhil. He grows up to be a proud ranger of Moriannon. Durhil gets up to many antics, at this stage, but they're not very important. He climbs the steps of Narcos as a child and even visits the dead marshes on a dare. But, of course, the power of Mordor rises and the Black Gate is attacked. Now, this is where I need to mention the fact that Moriannon and its history are detailed in both The Lord of the Rings, Return of the King and the Two Towers, and in The Silmarillion. Various details are provided, but the main thing to note here is a passage from The Rings of Power in the Third Age where it's stated categorically that the Black Gate has been abandoned since the kinstrife of Gondor. This means that what Monolith has said about the Black Gate being occupied might not be strictly canon. So let's have a look at this. The kinstrife was basically a civil war in Gondor back when it actually had kings, so over a thousand years before Shadow of Mordor is, Mordor is set. Even Aragorn in the books describes what I'm about to tell you as a long tale, but I'm going to try to make it as concise as possible. The Gondorian king Valakar married a woman of non-Numenorian blood, and this did not sit well with the Gondorian vassal states. When the two had a son, the heir to Gondor, uh, a man named Eldakar, a distant Numenorian full-blood relative of the royal family, aptly named Castamir the Usurper, led a rebellion against him, calling King Eldakar, and I quote, a half-breed bastard child. The war was eventually won by Eldakar, but not before many of the full-blooded Numenorians had been killed, weakening the Gondorian administration considerably. 
Interestingly enough, the descendants of Castamere would eventually become the Corsairs we see in Lord of the Rings, uh, which the ghost army of Aragorn is used to defeat towards the end, but I digress. The point is, the Kinstripe Wars were when the remains of the Gondorian nobility were forced to pull troops from what was then the outer defences of the realm. It was this civil war that would deplete Gondor in so many ways, making it impossible to maintain its distant fortresses, such as Moriannon. This war reduced the size of the territory that could be called Gondor, and it removed Moriannon from their sphere of influence. But we are talking about a thousand years here. A thousand years the Black Gate stood, apparently, as nothing more than an abandoned relic of an ancient time. It is still possible, if not stated directly in the Silmarillion, that a steward of Gondor, perhaps under the council of Gandalf, who found out about Sauron's return in Dol Guldur, posted men at the Black Gate, just as Monolith is suggesting. This makes sense if we consider the character of Exilion, Denethor's father, who would have been responsible for this decision had it ever been made. Tolkien describes him as a man devoted to the defense of Gondor and of reclaiming its outer defences. While he does not specifically mention the Black Gate, the fact that Aragorn, who at this time had adopted the moniker of Throngil to hide his true lineage from the stewards, he had befriended Exilion and recommended that he heed the counsel of Gandalf specifically during this time. Considering this, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that the steward would have commissioned a small force to hold the Old Gate, or at least observe Mordor from the Old Gate. It is not canon but it is possible. This is also probably why there are so few rangers depicted as being on the wall. We never actually see any of them during the battle in which the wall is taken by orcs. It is almost like this whole thing, this whole Shadow of Mordor game is almost like a footnote in history, lost to lore because of its ins insignificance. A handful of rangers sent to an ancient and abandoned fortress wall to watch for the rise of the Dark Lord, and they never got to report anything of their plight as they were all slain. It's actually quite epic and quite cool, so I like what Monolith has done there. So yeah, Rangers on the Moriannon, half century prior to the War of, War of the Ring. Not canon, but possible. So, let's continue. What happens next? Well, this is the interesting part. The Black Gate is attacked and taken by orcs and Uruk of Mordor. Just to be clear, the pl presence of Uruk in this battle is actually canon. Some people have argued that Uruks wouldn't have been around then, they were invented by Saruman. That's not entirely true. The first appearance of Uruks in Tolkien's works is in his description of the sacking of Askiliath in the year 2475 of the Third Age, roughly 500 years before Shadow of Mordor is set. Uruks of such number as to blacken the white steps of Askiliath flowed like a river of death over the besieged city. So yeah, Uruks at the Black Gate, 50 years before the War of the Ring, is totally fine and totally within the bounds of canon. After the slaughter of all the rangers upon the wall, Talion, his wife Yerith, and his son Durhil are ritualistically killed in a ceremony involving blood and bone as a means of restoring the Wraith Celebrimbor. Now, here is where it gets obscenely complicated. A Wraith in Tolkienian lore is always evil. There are no good wraiths. Tolkien was very clear in all of his works that natural equals good, unnatural equals bad. Any undead being is therefore bad. A wraith is actually the baddest of the bad, a being committed to the void, or Shadowlands, Sauron's domain. And the Shadowlands, look, nothing good exists there. It is described, amongst other descriptors, as being a land of death, forgotten memories, and the Nazgul. It was a realm created by, or brought into existence by, we're not really sure, Sauron, or perhaps even Morgoth. In fact, the only way you could get there was through the use of one of the Rings of Power, or by being stabbed by a Morgul blade and having a piece of it work, your way, work its way into your heart and corrupt every part of your living soul until you are nothing more than a shadow of your former self. Even the dead men of Dunharrow are not considered to be wraiths. They're just ghosts. They're not evil enough to have that title, and they betrayed their entire state, put in jeopardy an entire war effort, and denied their oath to the king. So yeah, you get the general idea. To be a wraith, you've got to be pretty evil. This means that Celebrimbor's wraith, in Shadow of Mordor, is evil, and bound to walk the divide between the living and the dead. Now, if you look at Celebrimbor's actions and attitudes throughout the, the course of the game, this is not too much of a stretch. 
He let slaves be beaten and killed in order to create a distraction. Well, this doesn't bode well. Don't you see? The prisoner created a distraction. He lies to Talion in order to keep him as a meat suit. You said we were cursed. You deceived me. It was Sauron's doing. This was your doing! I should have died with my family. I thought you wanted revenge. He wears the One Ring of Power. And personally leads an orc army. These actions, in a Tolkien fantasy setting, are in fact the epitome of evil. Just because he seems to be fighting Sauron does not matter. Remember, Saruman also fought Sauron. Yeah, in the movies he's put forward as being a servant of Sauron more than uh, an equal. However, in the books, Saruman wants to dominate all life on Middle-earth as well. And he actually sees Sauron as an ally and even a potential rival. So, yeah, uh, simply fighting Sauron does not automatically make you good. It is possibly to, possible to be evil and to fight Sauron. Okay, regardless of what mon the monolith developers had in mind, this is the Celebrimbor they created by making him a wraith. He is evil. So let's see if this works given the rest of Celebrimbor's story. What kind of elf was he? And does it fit that he became an evil wraith comparable to the ring wraiths? He was an ancient Noldorian elf, born in Valinor in the Year of the Trees. This is a time that predates the First Age. He is frickin' ancient. In order to begin gleaning his character, let's examine his, first his parentage. His father was Curfin the Crafty, who was in turn the son of Fëanor. Now, this is epic. This means that Celebrimbor's granddad was the elf who captured the light of the two trees of Valinor and crafted the three Silmarils. You know, the stones the Silmarillion itself is named after? They are the objects that contain the last light of the trees, as the original trees were destroyed by Morgoth and Ungoliant. Interesting side note for listeners who might like a bit of movie context, it is sometimes hinted that the Arkenstone of Erebor is actually one of the Silmarils, so that's kind of cool. So yeah, Celebrimbor's granddad is perhaps the most famous elf who ever lived. He was also a narcissistic, self-absorbed nutbag. And let me explain that. After Morgoth and Ungoliant destroyed the trees of Valinor, the Valar asked him for the Silmarils so they could restore the trees back to life. Fëanor refused, as he was totally captivated with his own creation. This led to the eventual capturing of the Silmarils by Morgoth, who used them to attain power over Middle-earth. As Sauron was the lieutenant of Morgoth, it could be argued that Fëanor's selfishness actually brought about all the troubles in Middle-earth. So yeah, uh, that's Celebrimbor's granddad. Now let's look at his dad. Now let's be clear, Curifin the Crafty, Celebrimbor's dad, was a bastard. During the First Age, he kidnapped Luthien, connived to get Finrod killed, brutally offended Aeol, and he took part in two separate kin slayings. This elf was nasty, and even though Celebrimbor eventually leaves his father, breaking all times with, ties with him and his family, he still stood back and watched all of this happen. So, Celebrimbor's ancestry, well... It has some shockingly evil parentage. Not as evil as Morgoth or S Sauron, but pretty damn bad in its own way. So, Celebrimbor himself. We've looked at his parents, now let's look at him. What did he get up to as the grandson of the greatest elven craftsman who ever lived? Well, he told his entire family to get stuffed, which, let's face it, considering what we've just learned, that's a good thing, and settled in Middle-earth in a place called Eregion, on the western side of what would eventually be called the Misty Mountains. He befriended the local dwarves who lived in the ancient ancestral dwarven home of Kazak Doom. Yes, the same Kazak Doom which hit a Balrog, ba where Gandalf fought the Balrog, which Thorin would eventually one day attempt to reclaim with his uh, father and grandfather. You remember the film. Okay, Celebrimbor came to lead all of the Nol Noldorian elves in the region. He was an expert craftsman and created many wondrous items, including this little gem most people will be familiar with. Yeah, check out the little symbol in the middle, right in the middle. That is the symbol of House Fëanor, which of course is Celebrimbor's symbol now. And have a listen to this. It's a riddle. Speak friend and enter. What's the elvish word for friend? Melon. 
why is the password elvish? Well, because it was created by an elf, namely Celebrimbor. So are you starting to appreciate how significant this character actually is? It's quite incredible. That's the reason why I was so uh, amazed and I had a nerdgasm when I realized that he was going to be in the game. All right, now, now we come to the big criticism normally leveled at Shadow of Mordor regarding its adherence to canon. The game allegedly suggests that Celebrimbor made all of the Rings of Power, which definitely, definitely did not happen in the Silmarillion. This is actually misleading, however. This part of Shadow of Mordor's story is completely compatible with canon. Let me explain. About halfway through the Second Age, Sauron, calling himself Anatar, which is Elven for Lord of Gifts, befriended the Noldor of Eregion. He claimed to be an emissary of the Valar, basically angelics, and instructed them, that is the Elves of Eregion, in the art of ring-making. Celebrimbor distrusted him, but the smiths of Eregion were deceived and seduced by all that Anatar was offering. Now, under the guidance and instruction of Sauron, posing as Anatar, the smiths openly made rings to learn the craft, but unknown to them, the craft taught by Anatar incorporated a, incorporated a binding magic into the ring. This meant that all of the rings, and anyone wearing them, could be controlled by a master ring. Now, I want to be very clear about this. All the smiths of Eregion were taught to do this, including Celebrimbor. Anatar taught Celebrimbor how to make rings. Very important. Now, there were a total, in the end, of 19 lesser rings for power created during this period. Three of these rings were definitely created by Celebrimbor in private. He did this deliberately. Remember, he did not fully trust Anatar. He didn't know he was Sauron, but he didn't fully trust him. Now, the three rings he created were the Rings of the Elves, the fairest of the Rings of Power. Celebrimbor actually named them. He called them Vilya, Narya, and Nenya, after the principal Middle-earth elements of air, fire, and water, respectively. And most people know what happens next. Sauron forged in secret a Master Ring, in which he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. As soon as he slipped the Ring of Power on his finger, all of the Eregian elves wearing them fell under his dominion. Fortunately, Celebrimbor had forged his own three rings, which were untouched by Sauron, and therefore not as easily influenced. He and the other ring bearers, including Galadriel at this time, were able to remove them. He then freed the rest of their brethren, and went on to resist Sauron. Sauron's plan to subdue the elves through trickery had all but failed, but he still believed it could work with the other less powerful races, provided he could procure the rings that had been forged to be used again. So, what did he do? He invaded Eregion with an orc army and destroyed the Noldor kingdom of Celebrimbor. He captured Celebrimbor and tortured him for, inf for information regarding the location of the 19 rings of power so that it could be reused and re-gifted to others. Celebrimbor, under torture, confessed the location of 16 rings, but withheld the location of the three he had made in private. Sauron then killed Celebrimbor. This is the tale told by the Silmarillion. So let's see what Monolith made of this story. So let's have a look at this scene. What's happening in this scene? Well, exactly what the Silmarillion says happened. This scene depicts Celebrimbor practicing his early ring craft by making some, but not all, of the lesser rings of power. And this is totally canon. Remember, there were 19 rings in total, but in this scene there are only 7. Considering this then, Celebrimbor might, at a stretch, have created half the rings of power? But that's assuming all of these rings were successfully made. And assuming that that this is his final trial. Remember, this scene depicts Anatar teaching Celebrimbor the art of Ringcraft. It is logical that he might not have, that he might not have got the door right, that he might have experienced some failures. This cutscene has Sauron examining one ring, placing it down, then picking up another. This new ring is emphasized by a glow, as though perhaps all of the other rings are inferiors, and Celebrimbor, after much practice, has finally gotten this one right. And of course, Sauron hits him with a platitude. Only you could accomplish such art, Celebrimbor. Monolith now elaborates on Tolkien's story, and kind of deviates from it somewhat. According to the Silmarillion, Sauron invades Eregion, captures Celebrimbor, tortures him for the location of the other rings, and finally kills him. There is no further explanation in the book. That's the end of Celebrimbor's um, contribution. Monolith uses this empty area in the narrative to add a new element, Celebrimbor's family, including his wife and daughter to the mix. This is definitely not canon. Celebrimbor 
was the last descendant of Fionnur. This is something he was famous for. The line of the Silmaril crafters ended with him, and which was, as explained before, a massive deal. He therefore could not have had a child, for that child would have been the last descendant of Fionnur, not Celebrimbor. Then again, Celebrimbor during the game never actually identifies the two figures in his dreams as his wife and daughter. They are sometimes called his kin and his family, but this could be referring to a sister and niece for all we know. Either way, it is a slaying of these two figures which devastates Celebrimbor, and it's an important part of his fall in this extended story arc. In the monolith exa elaboration, Celebrimbor is held by Sauron and forced to add the final touches on the Rings of Power. I actually like and appreciate this touch. The Ring of Power is the Ring of Power regardless of what's written on it. According to Tolkien, the writing upon the ring binds the spirit of Sauron to Mordor. That's all that's ever said about it. It has nothing to do with its other powers, or that's what's implied. This is the reason why Sauron, during the War of the Ring, is able to manifest in Mordor when his physical form is destroyed, because his soul endures within the Ring and is therefore bound to Mordor. Yay. Of course, Monolith does not stop there with their extension. Fueled by a fear for his family's well-being, Celebrimbor steals the Ring of Power and actually wears the damn thing. Wearing the Ring of Power itself, the One Ring, he escapes into Mordor. There he uses effectively the power of the ring to assemble and lead a massive army of orcs and he uses it to almost defeat Sauron but the ring betrays Celebrimbor and he is caught Sauron uses that original hammer he gifted to Celebrimbor to kill his family and rather viciously kills him too So this is the extension there from beginning to end. This, considering his family's history and what he was trying to escape from when he settled in Middle-earth, would have been enough to consume him with a measured amount of rage. Now consider all that rage in addition to the fact that he wore the Ring of Power for an extended period of time. The Ring of Power answers to only one master and it corrupts anybody who touches it. This is enough to produce a wraith from a spiritual point of view. So, regardless of all the little embellishments, Monolith has said, how do we make him a wraith? Have him wear the Ring of Power for an extended period of time and become evil. And that's exactly what has been done here. Therefore, compatible with canon. Compatible. Jumping forward about 3,000 years, Celebrimbor is now a wraith summoned into the body of a recently executed ranger, Italian. Right, now it's time to get technical. The big questions here are how and why, and we're going to tackle how first. So how is Celebrimbor here? What mechanism allows him to manifest as a wraith? Well, a wraith is bound by its very nature to the Shadow Realm, or the Shadowlands. This binding can be the effect of a ring, or a piece of Morgul blade lodged in the heart. The law doesn't suggest any other way of accomplishing it. In every instance, however, it does require a physical object with power to make the wraith possible. So there must be an object, possibly a ring, that is responsible for Celebrimbor's lingering presence. Given the cutscenes, it is probably not the effect of a Morgul blade. I believe the ring responsible is actually the ring, wait for it, of Saruman. It's probably got a, ra a lot of raised eyebrows now. You're probably going, what? He's reaching a bit, isn't he? Saruman's ring? I didn't even know Saruman had a ring. Okay, well, have a listen. Let me explain. Saruman the White spent much of the time following the Battle of the Five Armies, searching for the One Ring. He was obsessed with the idea of becoming a master of Middle-earth in the same way Sauron had attempted. He coveted this so much he actually attempted to create a ring of, I a ring of power of his own from an existing ring. He failed but he still produced a ring of considerable magical ability. This ring is not mentioned in the movies, but it definitely appears in the books, and is widely considered to be one of the 19 rings of power created during the Second Age by the elves of Oregion. Uh, I'll give you a quote. Uh, but I rode to the foot of Orthanc and came to the stair of Saruman, and there he met me, and led me up to his high chamber, and he wore a ring upon his finger. Gandalf mentions this ring when he's describing his meeting with Saruman, Saruman also, on one occasion, refers to himself as Saruman the Ringmaker. 
Saruman wanted to learn how to create rings of power himself. That was his main goal, primarily so he could challenge Sauron and take over himself. So ask yourself, who has the power to bind a wraith to a ring, to summon a wraith using magic rit ritual, and to mind control the black hand into doing this? <laughs> Come back to me, Elf Lord. His ability to mind control is actually one of his main abilities as a wizard. The main challenge to this idea is the argument that Celebrimbor's summoning was due either to A, Sauron working through the back hand, or B, it's the black hand working independently. These are obvious, okay? This is what it looks like at first glance. These would appear to be the obvious explanations, but take it as a given. When we hear the black hand say, Come back to me, Elf Lord, that is definitely not Sauron. <laughs> it's definitely not Sauron speaking through the black hand. I mean, think about it. Why would he want Celebrimbor back in the first place? To make more rings? Remember, it was Sauron who taught Celebrimbor the art of ringcraft, so there is absolutely no purpose the Elf Lord can serve to Sauron. The Black Hand, maybe? As an independent? Maybe he's trying to, you know, usurp some power by getting a ring of his own, by summoning... Well, maybe. Possibly, but extremely unlikely. The Black Hand is supposed to be the primary captain of the still incorporeal Sauron, pending the full resurrection of the Wing King, Witch King of Agmar. It is doubtful that Sauron would have such a free thinker in charge of his entire garrison. Not only that, but the Black Hand could not really benefit from a Ring of Power. I mean, he already has the complete and total loyalty of thousands and thousands of orcs, and wearing a Ring of Power would just make him subject to the the One Ring, so even more. So, I don't know. It, it doesn't make any sense for either the Black Hand or Sauron to want to resurrect Celebrimbor. In fact, it would be more trouble than it's worth. Only Saruman has a motive to bring back the last descendant of Fionnur. And his name has not been dropped into the mix here without context or calling. Saruman's involvement is clearly established in this cutscene. been under the spell of a very powerful wizard. Talion, I am sorry. Saruman brought you here against my will. I went to him for help. I ended up being a prisoner within my own body. See? Sar Saruman wants Celebrimbor's soul, and he can get it through the people he possesses. So how does all this play out? Well, Saruman finds one of Celebrimbor's old lesser rings of power puts it on and binds the lingering wraith spirit of Celebrimbor to it. He tries to bend the spirit to his will, but Celebrimbor has worn the Ring of Power, so where does his spirit go? Right where the ring text says it should go, straight to Mordor. Saruman then possesses the Black Hand and says, Come back to me, Elf Lord, and here is where we have our story with a neat little twist. Come back to me means come back to Orthanc. Was it intentional? Was this something Monolith intended? to be implied? I don't know. But it works and makes a lot more sense than Sauron or the Black Hand wanting to summon him. That makes no sense at all. So there you have it. Saruman the White finds a ring of power to which the soul of Celebrimbor is bound by both wrath and hatred. Oh, and in addition to that, the fact that he wore the One Ring for an extended period of time. He summons this wraith from the Shadowlands. 
but did not know of Killer Brimble's little sabbatical with one ring of power, and therefore does not anticipate the Wraith's return to Mordor. He follows the Wraith there and summons him using necromancy, something he has been investigating. Killer Brimble possesses Talion, a murdering, exiled Gondorian full of rage and hatred, and they both begin attacking Sauron's force on a quest for vengeance. They murder their way up the Orc and Mordorian hierarchy before killing the Black Hand, who, for reasons known only to himself, takes on a similar outward form to Sauron when possessed by Celebrimbor. Now, I want you to think about this. This shows how frickin' evil Celebrimbor is at this stage. He actually turns his host into a flaming replica of his most hated enemy. Talion kills the Black Hand with Celebrimbor's help. Celebrimbor states that they can never defeat Sauron, implying that that was not Sauron that they were just fighting. This is no longer our battle. I tried fighting him. It can't be done. And Talion declares that the time has come for the forging of a new ring. The time has come for a new ring. And roll credits. Now, this is actually really good adaptive storytelling, and it leaves enough blanks for others to fill with their knowledge and have fun doing it, just like we're doing right now. Not to mention it being a very cinematic game, of course. However, the final criticism I want to address involves the previous point I just made. Many academics have said that Shadow of Mordor does not follow Tolkien literary lines, does not follow standard quest narrative plot structure, and definitely does not follow Tolkien themes. The criticism can be summarized as, this story is not Tolkien. Well, actually it is, but it's just not finished yet, and I want to explain this. The theme of the game, if looked at as just an independent story, is memories drive vengeance, and vengeance yields justice. Wow, this is definitely not a theme that Tolkien would own. Tolkien often described the pursuit of vengeance as being something that more commonly yields hurtful downfall. Anyone in Lord of the Rings or the Silmarillion who sought revenge ended up hurting by the end of their story. But Shadow of Mordor represents only the first 25% of the hero's journey plot format. I want you to look at this chart. This represents what the hero's journey looks like. So... Talion is called to adventure, the first part of the hero's journey, an adventure of revenge. He refuses the call, manifest by his desire to simply die with his family and not pursue revenge. He is convinced through the lies of an evil wraith not to die and to continue his life in order to pursue vengeance. He receives supernatural aid in the form of elven powers, including wraith sight and wraith shot, things that allow him to continue on the quest. And finally, he faces down the Threshold Guardians, leaving the world he is familiar for the world that remains undiscovered. The Threshold Guardians being the three primary boss battles. So here we are. In the sequel, which we all know is coming, Talion will probably enter the next stage of the hero's journey. But the but Tolkien's primary theme, Revenge Quests Lead to Tragedy, does not need to be apparent yet. In fact, if it was it would actually be violating Tolkien law. So there you have it, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed my rambling dissertation on Shadow of Mordor. Once again, I have no problems with the lore of this game. It is great. I really, really enjoyed it. And I also really enjoy how they've incorporated elements of the Silmarillion through archaeology you find during the game and through its cutscenes. Um, it's been done very, very well. So, Anyway, uh, if you disagree with anything I've said, please feel free to put it in the comments. I will reply to you. Thanks a lot, everybody, and I'll see you next time. Yeah!